Hello everyone, and welcome back to The Bridgehead. My name is Jonathan Van Maren, and today we're going to be talking about something that people rarely like to talk about. That would be the topic of pornography. And I know people are hesitant to talk about this issue because I've spoken on this issue in high schools, uh, for parent evenings, uh, for churches, you name it, even on university campuses, which as you can imagine is a pretty hostile atmosphere to discuss pornography. And I'm going to have my friend uh, Josh Gilman, you guys probably know all about him already as he's been on this show before, I'm going to have him on to talk about two main topics. First is going to be a conference in Ottawa that everybody who can go should register for on pornography, which is, is going to be put on by Josh and Strength the Fight, which is the Ottawa-based nonprofit that works to educate the culture on pornography that Josh runs. He is the executive director of that organization. And the second topic we're going to discuss is the incel movement and the role pornography plays in fueling that movement. Some of you may recognize the name incel as a term that's been bandied out uh, bandied about a lot since the murders last week in Toronto when a young man used a vehicle to smash his way through a sidewalk crowded of people. He, he killed 10 people with that vehicle and injured another 15 or 16. And it turns out that he may have been a member of the incel movement. And we'll get into that topic as well. So without further introduction, I'd like to present a conversation with myself and my friend Josh Gilman. So first things first, uh, tell our listeners about the conference in Ottawa that you need everybody to know about. Uh, well, the Strong and Free Conference is going to be a first-of-its-kind Canadian event uh, where we are going to look at the issue of pornography as a whole, uh, kind of start from, you know, where did this problem even come from, and then just go right through the history of what it's done to us uh, as a society, uh, the spiritual effect that it's had on us, and then march through, um, you know, the process of finding healing, not just personal healing, but how do we deal with this in our families? How do we deal with this in society? Uh, we're going to hear from people who are seeing results all over the world in terms of changing policy and, and how to do that. Um, and we're going to finish with um, MP Arnold Gerson kind of giving us a challenge to, to make a difference however we can. Uh, he just went from being you know, a mechanic in Alberta who felt like someone should do something. And then he went out and did something. And and the whole point of it is that we actually can make a difference. Uh, we actually can live in a Canada that is stronger and freer when we work together. And so we're bringing in 10 of, I think, the best speakers that we could possibly imagine to just really, really look at what we're fighting and very specifically how to fight it. So I'm telling everybody, this is not a what's the problem type of conference. This is a what is the solution type of conference. And we think that uh, we're going to hear what the solution is. It's not just throwing up our hands and saying what's the solution. It is literally going to be here are the people who can tell us what the solution is. And Arnold Viersen, that name will be familiar to a lot of people. He's been on this show before, back when he was uh, trying to get a motion passed in order to get the Standing Committee on Health to talk about the connections between porn and sexual violence. But he's done a lot since then, has he not? Yeah, he's been involved in all sorts of different initiatives uh, to fight um, exploitation of children, of women and men. Um, and it's been really amazing to see, and that's why we wanted him to come share, because he, I remember when he first was elected, he was just a regular Canadian who kind of knew that there was a problem and was saying, what can I do? Uh, how can I possibly do something? And he was going around just kind of asking other people, what can we possibly do? And then um, I had the pleasure of being at the same event in Washington, D.C. with him, uh, several weeks ago, the National Summit on uh, Ending Sexual Exploitation, which is kind of a big international conference, and seeing him interacting with all these experts from all over the world and how comfortable he was, which I think would have come as a surprise to him just a couple of years ago, uh, young dad, couple of kids, not thinking these would be his his people, that he's comfortable dealing with all these really complex issues and how quickly he's kind of become a voice on this thing. 
And I think that if we went back and asked him a couple years ago, where do you see yourself in two years? He would not have thought that that would be uh, his arena. And yet he's doing all sorts of excellent work to the point that when they did a um, an event on Parliament Hill a couple months ago on preventing sexual abuse, some of the other MPs from other parties who were just supposed to introduce the event went totally off script and just were honoring him for the work that he's done. And it was cool to see just the, the impact he's made on not just the people who are being affected by these issues, but other Canadians of different political stripes who see that he's making a real difference. Now, when you first uh, fired me a message on this podcast, it's interesting because the topic you brought up for us to discuss, to, to prove to people how pornography is relevant, uh, not only in our daily lives, our families, our communities, but even behind the headlines that we read, I had just been doing the research for a column on that exact same topic, which isn't particularly surprising because, uh, as our listeners might know, when you start doing anti-porn activism, whenever you see anything happen, you sort of think, I wonder what role pornography played in that horrible thing that happened. Exactly. And so one of the things that we were going to talk about today was the incel movement, because, of course, uh, last week, Monday, very tragically, somebody decided to take a vehicle down the sidewalk in Toronto. Ten people were killed, and at least 16 people were severely injured. Uh, the fellow who did it was named uh, Alec Manassian. We don't know for sure why he did what he did yet, but there are some initial indications that he was part of what's known as the incel movement, which stands for involuntarily celibate. It's these this group of people, it's sort of the misogynist version of the alt-right. You know, the alt-right is obsessed with race and all of these things, and the incel movement is obsessed with the fact that fundamentally... They think there's some sort of female conspiracy going on to ensure that they never have sex. They're very bitter. This has turned into a hatred of the opposite gender. And there's a couple of, of Facebook posts that indicate that Manassian might have at least had some relationship with that community. Uh, since his arrest and subsequent uh, charge in court, it is certainly true that the incel community has been celebrating him as a saint, as they call it, for drawing attention to their movement by murdering a whole bunch of people with his vehicle. So what was your first reaction when you saw the incel name enter this discussion? Because I remember the first thing I thought of was the relationship to violent pornography that is so pervasive there. Yeah, I don't think I even thought of violent pornography. I just thought that um, it was the logical conclusion to all pornography, which is that other people exist for your pleasure. And if you buy that thought at all, then you are owed. Then you are owed sex. Um, I was listening to the radio uh, radio show a couple of days ago, I think, and they were discussing sex robots. And and to right. my to my, uh, I was pleased that the hosts, for the most part, were more focused on the dangers and how they thought it was entirely creepy. But Almost every single person calling in kept on referring to, well, what about those with sexual needs who blah, blah? Or what about the ones with perverse sexual needs? And they always referred to to sex as a need. Um, and maybe someone is going to disagree with me who's listening to this, but sorry, sex is not a need. Breathing is a need. Eating is a need. Um, no one has ever died from not having sex. Um Sex is a desire, and when we talk about it as a need, and we just wrap it up in the general selfishness of society, and then you, like you said, you just you start consuming nonstop content that says that other people exist to meet that, in quotations here, need, then it doesn't really matter to me whether he was an official member or whatever of this incel movement. It's just another example that if he was even reading this stuff, his mind was there, that other people don't have value, other people don't matter. And what where my mind actually went was to thinking about the latest Pornhub report where um, the top two searched categories for men last year were Japanese and ebony, which means that there's people out there that see an entire race, ethnicity, as existing for their sexual pleasure. Like that they are seeing an entire race, an entire ethnicity as less than human, whose purpose exists for them. 
And and I was thinking about how that person who is consuming that type of content, and in this case, very intentionally, this is what they're looking for uh, and consuming most likely on a daily basis. They're going to look around the world and they're going to see Japanese people or black people as other, as less than human. And so then you look at these guys, these predominantly young men who are consuming content that says, Women exist for your pleasure. Women exist to, to meet your, again, in big air quotes, need. And so then when they are not having that need met, they, they see it as nefarious. They see it as someone out to get them. And so, sadly, I was not surprised that someone like this could then actually go out there and straight out cold blood murder people. Because whether or not he's some member of some group or whatever you want to, you know, whatever label people decide to put on him, uh, he is training himself to think of women as less than, as unhuman. Well, it goes even deeper than that. In the Facebook post that, that Alec Manassian released, he said, all hail the Supreme Gentleman Elliot Roger. Right. And for those who remember who Elliot Roger was, he's a guy who opened fire on a number of people in on May 23 of 2014 in California. And he's the most famous of the so-called incel movement because he explicitly stated in this giant manifesto he left behind that he wanted to murder women because he couldn't have them. And I did a bit of digging because, as you mentioned, right, sex is not a right uh, and it's, it's not a need. And so, in other words, these people who, who feel they have a right to sex, that they have a right to other people's bodies, where does this ideology come from? And as you explained, this ideology comes from pornography. A lot of the research that I do indicates that pornography also not only fuels this sort of uh, feeling of entitlement and possessiveness, but also uh, starts to deform the brain and insert these violent attractions in it. So I started actually going through Elliot Rogers' manifesto that he left behind. And I feel bad for you. Yeah, no, it was not fun. Uh, it's very long and not very well written. But he actually talks about how he was exposed to porn when he was 11 years old by a friend. And he writes, When I looked at the pictures, I was shocked beyond words. I had never seen what beautiful girls looked like naked, and the sight filled me with strong and overwhelming emotions. I was traumatized. My childhood was fading away. Ominous fear swept over me. Indeed, a whole new world opened up before me, and I had no idea to pre how to prevail in it. I think that's a very important statement. I still wanted to live as a child, and he saw porn again two years later when he was 13 after dabbling in it whenever he could. Uh, but he saw porn again, and he says, uh, The sight was shocking, traumatizing, and arousing. All of these feelings mixed together took a great toll on me. I walked home and cried by myself for a bit. I felt too guilty about what I saw to talk to my parents about it. Not getting any sex is what will shape the very foundation of my miserable youth. That explains a lot about the ideology that eventually convinced him he had the right to have sex and that he states explicitly in his manifesto, this isn't two anti-porn activists making this leap. No, it's him explicitly stating that this is where the desire for this began, and that eventually metastasized into the ideology that led him to take the lives of six people, including two of the very type of girl that he felt he had the right to sleep with. Exactly. And I think we need to understand that this isn't to lessen what these people have done, because um, murder is murder. Uh, so it's not giving excuses, but we need to understand what that experience as a child of seeing pornography actually does to people. Like, I can remember the first time I saw pornography, um, like hardcore pornography. And I mean, it was completely tame compared to what kids are watching today. Um, like, they would barely call it porn now. But I was 14 and I can remember going to walk my dog afterwards and shaking like shaking the whole time, like my body was shaking completely head to toe because I was completely unable to process what I'd seen, right? That that ridiculous cocktail of chemicals that were firing through my not grown up brain, completely unable to handle it. And so to me, it's not an excuse 
for anybody who's actually gone out and killed someone. But I think it's more of a wake-up call that it's like if we knew that kids out there, when they're 8, 9, 10, which are the most common ages to first be exposed to porn, if we knew that they were going out there and drinking 20 whatevers of you know some alcohol, that, that someone is just handing out shots to kids on the street, then we wouldn't be confused when the kids start going off the rails. Right, if if we knew that someone was just handing crack heroin to to our eight and nine year olds, we wouldn't be that confused about why our young men, our young women, are are being drawn into all sorts of trouble uh, and all sorts of dangerous paths. And yet, when stuff like this happens, and we and people make the connections back to porn people kind of shrug and go, huh, like, how did that work? And we're like, you, what are you talking about? Like you just said, this guy's entire innocence, his youth, his childhood was destroyed. So I'm not shocked. Like when I got several emails immediately after um, the the atrocious Toronto murder. Um, and, and they were saying, is this, one of the guys who wrote to me said, is this the first pornified mass murderer? And I just said, no, definitely not. Right? Like, we know this is a big factor in, in a lot of these situations, and we need to stop being surprised. Well, Elliot Roger, it's, it's interesting because one of the only reasons that people are asking questions like, is this the first pornified murder, is because people haven't paid close attention to pre- previous events. So mm-hmm. I, I, just, I just sort of read off a piece of Elliot Roger's manifesto there where he describes the experience that he had when he first saw pornography. But later on, this is almost at the end of his manifesto when he starts talking about how uh, that his whole life has led up to what he calls his day of retribution, where he sh- shoots this really creepy YouTube video talking about how he's going to get revenge on everybody for denying him the sex that he is owed. That's where he calls himself the Supreme Gentleman, which was apparently referred to in Alex Manassian's post. But here's what he says. He says, I started to masturbate on a regular basis, and at first I only did it uh, by rubbing on my bed, but eventually escalated to looking at pictures of girls online, uh, fantasizing about doing sexual things to them. If I didn't know how to access any porn sites, I would just browse regular websites until I found a picture of a girl. I developed a very high sex drive, and it would always remain like this. This was the start of hell for me. Going through puberty utterly doomed to my existence. It condemned me to live a life of suffering and unfulfilled desires. Even at that young age, we're talking like 13, 14 here, I felt Mm -hmm. depressed because I wanted sex, yet I felt unworthy of it. I don't think I was ever going to experience sex in reality, and I was right, I never did. I finally, I was finally interested in girls, but there was no way I could ever get them, and so my starvation began. Elliot Rogers is, is one of what they're referring to in criminological circles as the virgin killers. And we don't even have to make this leap between how pornography makes men feel entitled to female bodies because all they need to do to look at whatever they want. You brought up some of the repulsive porn categories that are being looked at. You can literally just go to Google and you can just enter in exactly what it is that you want to see and come up with that. So it develops a sense of entitlement. There's a lot of studies uh, Dr. Geldines, uh, Dr. Marianne Layden, explaining how pornography, even nonviolent pornography, promotes sexual aggression with men. Of course, that's to rate, uh, related directly back to these feelings of entitlement. And then, of course, pornography fuels rape culture. There's over a hundred studies establishing the links between sexual assault and pornography. That's just another crime born out of this idea that men have the right to female bodies and we don't know for sure uh, what the motivation of Alec Manassian was, but if that Facebook post, which Facebook Canada has confirmed to be his, was his, then his reference to the quote-unquote Supreme Gentleman Elliot Roger is very indicative, and these quotes that I've just uh, read to you and the listeners, which are directly uh, from Elliot Roger's pre-murder-suicide um, manifesto, indicate that pornography was really the beginning for him. Pornography was what led him down the path that ended uh, with murder and his ultimate death. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, this is just 
this is we need to take this so seriously in terms of what um what we're taking in what we're letting our kids take in um i was just discussing with one of our one of our uh, blog writers who, who's working on a piece on fantasy and just in terms of any any dwelling on this stuff how damaging it can be uh, again with a great example talking about how even if you just sit there and are dwelling in hours of fantasy in your fantasy no one says no right in your fantasy right. if it starts off as a no it turns to a yes and so you just through even something as uh, again <laughs> air quotes mundane as fantasizing uh you know all the time about having sex with with girls or whoever is you're you're training yourself to not understand that there is a no that there is an option for rejection um and then in fact the first time i heard of this group i believe it was an interview uh where jordan peterson brought it up uh, just talking about how it's such a dangerous path to go down this because you lose the ability to deal with rejection and then never mind rejection in relationship like rejection in life which is such a key to growing up up to to being able to have any resiliency in life and so we've got these young men that just have no way of coping um and i mean coping is it's such an important part of of growing up um like the first job as a parent is to help your kid understand that they can cope without being held all the time like coping is a very very key human aspect of life and these young men especially because of because of the way it relates to women obviously pornography affects men and women but in in this very specific instance unable to cope with the idea of rejection we need to understand what this is actually doing to us just the whole thing not just the violent stuff yeah obviously that gets there it escalates it can make things worse but just the entire idea that we're feeding into ourselves into our culture that that we deserve sex that we need sex and i think we need to understand how again it's it's not just the the guys pouring over hours and hours of violent hardcore pornography um our tv movies all sorts of these like the message that everybody needs sex is is super super dangerous and we need to consider the ramifications well, we're seeing and these ramifications aren't always extreme. So I, I do want to emphasize one thing for the mm-hmm. listeners. Uh, Josh and Jonathan aren't saying that if you look at porn, you will murder people. Um, <laughs> exactly. What we are saying is there is a spectrum of negative effects and dangerous ideologies that can be derived from porn. This is at the very far end of the spectrum. But the sorts of cases you and I have been dealing with for years now, talking to men. So I got an email Uh, Recently from a kid who is in grade 12, started looking at porn when he was in grade 6, and would love to ask a girl out to prom, but doesn't feel he can because he doesn't know how to talk to a girl without picturing them without clothes on. I talked to another guy whose relationship failed a couple of months into marriage because she caught him looking at pornography and couldn't get over the fact that this meant in her mind that their entire relationship prior to this had been a lie. Uh, We've both talked to young men who were essentially guilty of sexual assault without realizing it because they were simply playing out the things they had saw in porn that they thought were normal because that was their context for what sexuality was because they'd received no other sex education from their parents, their church, or any other responsible adult in their life if those adults were even present. So this is an extreme example of of what pornography can do to you and especially what pornography combined with other poisonous ideas can do to you but the other end of the spectrum the if you will air quotes the safer end of the spectrum is just as ugly and just as dangerous if you're the sort of person who wants to uh, live with other people love and be loved in return and that's what we tell like when we go into a school I was just in a high school the other day talking to a group of grade 10 boys right and we didn't go in there telling them that if they watch porn they're they're going to end up being murderers our whole thing was what do you want in life do you want to have a healthy relationship like do you want to be able to truly love someone and be loved like the choice is yours here's what porn will do to your mind the only option is becoming more selfish if you keep on watching porn like that is not negotiable that is what will happen to your brain you become a more selfish uh less able to relate to other people and what do you want and i think that's that's 
in a lot of ways that's that's the call to to the young men of today isn't so much be you know don't be a murderer because obviously but what do you actually want in life what choices do you want to make today in order to actually have a truly fulfilled whole life like do you want to be able to be a resilient person who can handle the fact that life is tough this is i think the call to specifically uh, to young men uh, on on this topic about just what do you want or or do you want to like it doesn't matter if you're a selfish person that ends up hurting someone physically or a selfish person that just is lonely and miserable because you don't know how to deal with anything in life like those are those are both bad outcomes so so make the choice and i remember watching a documentary where uh, there was a guy who was talking about dealing with substance abuse and he's a former NHL player. And his quote was, after getting clean, his, his biggest regret in life, he says, I wish I got to play with, a, with my whole mind. I wish I got a chance to, to redo my career, but do it with a whole mind. And, and I think that's the, the challenge to young people, guys and girls. Like, what do you want? Do you want to get to go through life with your whole mind? Or do you want to go through life dealing with all the negative repercussions of pornography and you get to choose well that's a, a good place for you to explain why people should come to the conference again and live their whole life and not be terrible sad human beings um, <laughs> this is why i'm the bad cop additionally make sure you tell, give people the website where they can find this all the information they need so that once they stop listening to this they can go online on their phone or whatever and they can sign up for the conference right away yeah, it's strongfreecanada.ca. That is strongfreecanada.ca. And again, this is going to be, uh, it goes from Friday evening uh, right through Saturday. And we're really going to take a, a very holistic look at the entire issue. Uh, starting off with why do humans even have value in the first place? Like with some of these things, we think we really understand them and we don't often sit and think. Uh, about what we really believe about humanity is like let's start at the beginning why do humans matter at all because unless we really really get that then it's hard to hard to care about all this stuff um, so we're just gonna we're gonna start there and then again looking at some of the very specific lies that came through the sexual revolution uh, if if people are confused about where these destructive thoughts that come through pornography started uh, it started with a lot of intentional in some cases lies during the sexual revolution and, and some very specific social engineering to change the way that people uh, thought about sex and and then going right into um, dealing with the fact that this is a huge problem amongst young women uh, whenever we go to schools universities you know this as well as I do there's, there's as many women that come forward and talk about being addicted to porn how it's how it's ruined their lives especially if they're under 30 um, it's about yeah. the exact same rate as with guys um, and so we're going to talk about that, both from the perspective of girls who are struggling with pornography and then what it's just like to be a woman in today's world that is so pornified. You know, what is it like to try to deal with the world in a, you know, in a Me Too era? It doesn't matter if you haven't experienced any of those stories yourself. You're living in that world as as a woman. How do we actually deal with that? How do we handle that? Um, and then we're going to look at the very specific um, and, and successful ta tactics that are being used around the world. Um, we're going to have Don Hawkins, the um, director of the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. They're one of the major players behind uh, getting Backpage.com shut down. Uh, they're the reason why YouTube Kids exist. Uh, they've been key in getting seven states to declare pornography a public health crisis. And, and she's coming to, to discuss how do we actually get these things done for real? How do we actually make change in a society that, that often seems so ignorant. Um, and then moving into, you know, how do we talk about this just with our friends and family? Because it's something that's really difficult. We get so many parents coming up to us and saying, like, I know I want to be more careful about even, you know, what, what friends' houses my kids go to play at. I don't know how to have those conversations. So we're going to talk about it. How do we have those conversations? And then how do we find freedom? How do we find freedom? How do we heal our marriages? How do we move forward? The fact is that we know... Um, you know, if we were doing a conference on human trafficking, not many people in the audience would have ever trafficked anybody. Um, 
when we're talking about pornography, we know that most of us in the room have dealt with pornography. A lot of people, it's affected them quite negatively, if not currently, at some point in their life, so they're still dealing with that. And so we're going to address that. How do we move forward? How do we rebuild healthy marriages, uh, healthy parent-child relationships around these issues, and, and find, find personal healing? And then, again, we're going to have a lot of ways that people can get involved to, to make a difference. Uh, you know, there was a great quote, and I'm blanking. I'm going to remember as soon as, as, soon as I speak. We on this interview. Um, it might it was probably Marianne Layden who talked about you know why why go after um, why figure out who's behind the porn industry and she said that you know after years of being a therapist she got sick of pulling people out of the river and she wanted to go downstream and figure out who was pushing them in. Right. And and while that's a very powerful image, I think an even more powerful image is saying what can we do to make sure that our kids never get pushed in in the first place? What can we do to make our kids uh, you know resilient against a society that is trying to pornify so many aspects of life to the point where we can truly have porn-proof families. And we don't mean porn-proof in the way that you're never going to see anything. Porn-proof in the way that your jacket is waterproof. That means that if you go out and it rains, the rain doesn't affect you. And we think that we actually can have porn-proof families. We can have porn-proof kids. We can have porn-proof churches and schools and and communities. And so it's going to be all about building towards that. So strongfreecanada.ca. Um, check it out. It's going to be unbelievable. I'm so excited for it because, quite frankly, what I did is I sat down and I said, what is the conference I've always wanted to attend? Why don't I make it? Right. <laughs> and, that, and that's how and that's how it got put together. So I'm very excited. Uh, but it's going to be truly, truly excellent. Well, Josh, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. That, ladies and gentlemen, was a conversation with Josh Gilman of Strength to Fight. Please do take his advice and head over to register for the Anti-Porn Conference in Ottawa as soon as you can, if you're available, or at least tell your friends about it. If you're interested in hearing our previous shows, head over to thebridgehead.ca. We've uh, recently had discussions with uh, the son of famous British author George Orwell, with commentator Peter Hitchens, philosopher Sir Roger Scruton, you name it, we've covered an entire variety of topics, all of them I think very interesting, so head over there to check it out. We're also on SoundCloud, YouTube, and iTunes, just look for The Bridgehead, and this show was brought to you by Total Rentals. Thanks so much for joining us, we hope you can join us again next week.